Good afternoon, everyone. Scripture provides us with valuable lessons with regard to moving outside our comfort zone. Jesus often crossed established borders and embraced the other. Jesus' encounter with the woman of Samaria at the well is written in the Gospel of John is one of many such encounters. In his border crossing, Jesus confronted religious and social bias of first century Palestine. Border crossing becomes a metaphor for the incarnation as Christ emptied himself in the presence of others, in his acts of humility and self-giving. The Apostle Paul spoke to the people of Philippi and explain to them how the gospel is to be realized. The apostle poured himself as a drink on the sacrifices they were making in their faith and rejoiced with them as he acknowledged their sufferings. I did not grasp the meaning of those scripture passages until I was afforded the opportunity to follow the daily ministry of six church leaders in two indigenous communities in northern Saskatchewan over a period of one month in the fall of 2014. This led to my research question. How did a lived experience and pa of pastoral ministry in two indigenous communities in northern Saskatchewan affect my identity as an Anglican priest in my team ministry in rural Nova Scotia. My research project has eight goals. The slides you will see are but a few of the many pictures I took on my journey. I experienced significant and experiential pastoral encounters during my visit to LaRange and Stanley Mission. The communities of Wayaquin and Hall Lake were also a part of my experiential pastoral encounter. I learned about the values, belief systems, historical experiences, and resources in an unfamiliar cultural setting of woodland Cree heritage. My current understanding of pastoral ministry was largely confined to my cradle Anglican roots 
in communities of which I have been a lifelong member. Moving outside the familiar and being immersed in the unfamiliar was a profound experience and enabled me to see ministry of presence in new ways. I saw servanthood and servant leadership through a lens that afforded me new insights. I developed a new perspective on my local pastoral ministry. My cross-border experience challenged my personal views concerning my own culture, ethics, theology, and politics. I became connected to the social struggles of the communities I visited. I was left wondering why I was less connected to the social struggles in the communities in which I minister. And the final goal was to foster the connect connections I make with people in my cross-border experience. I employed phenomenology as my research methodology. The research became a collection of stories of intense human experiences. I tried to put aside my own beliefs about the phenomena being observed. I organized my data into themes. Each theme was a competent composite description of a phenomenon, and my experiences have been transformed into my consciousness, and my life has changed forever. While it could be argued that a relatively short cross-cultural visit could not possibly have such a profound impact on my consciousness and my identity, I would argue I have played the lived experience over and over in my mind since my return to team ministry in my home parish. By examining the essence of pastoral ministry from a biblical, historical, and theological background, I better understood the activities comprised in pastoral ministry. Pastoral ministry varies in multiplicity, it varies in diversity, and it is highly situational. My research question led me to describe the person I was prior to my cross-border experience. What were the embedded cultural assumptions that shaped how I saw myself in relation to my environments? How were my feelings, my thoughts, my perceptions challenged in a culture that embraced different ideologies. I realized in my lived experience in northern Saskatchewan, I did not have a sensitivity to Aboriginal culture. I could not see my personal complicity in sin for the past and present sins committed in the name of Christianity. Grace has, as God's unmerited favor crystallized for me as I pondered God's kindness that was presented to me by the people I met, despite my complicity in sin. Data collection consisted of three primary sources, observations, interviews, and documents. I recorded the activities of six pastoral leaders. Interviews with the six participants were either recorded and transcribed or crafted from memory immediately following the interview. Six vignettes emerged in the course of my lived experience. I entitled the six vignettes, the bulletin board, these are my people, the elder's hat, our font runneth over, the wake and the funeral of baby Alice. And my final vignette, which I share with you now, my pilgrimage to Stanley Mission and Holy Trinity Anglican Church. I will have, I will mention the person with whom I um, attended. It is Eugene Morasti. I can do that with his permission. And this particular vignette occurred in bits and pieces in the Northern Cree News, which is a publication of the Saskatchewan, uh, Diocese of Saskatchewan, and it also occurred in Contact, which is a newsletter that is 
uh, circulate it throughout the North, churches in the North, to talk about their sacramental um, and sacrificial ministry. I'm traveling north this morning to Stanley Mission, where I met with Eugene, a lifelong resident of the community. I met Eugene at a wake in La Ronge just the week before. I'm heading into wilderness country as the pavement on the main highway to the north turns into crushed stone and then to gravel. After approximately 40 minutes of driving and being careful to avoid large trucks that are obviously accustomed to navigating the gravel road with their large loads at considerable speed, I come to a sign in the right fork of the road that tells me it is 38 kilometers to Stanley Mission. Another sign informs me the community is dry. I remember reading how the dry movement swept Saskatchewan in the 1970s and was an attempt by the leaders in the communities to curb the catastrophic effect of alcohol abuse. As I see the sign, I wonder if Stanley Mission has that problem. I make a right turn and proceed at a snail's pace as the road is under construction. I fear my rented Ford Fiesta may not be up for the challenge. <laughs> the scenery is breathtaking. Jack pine, spruce, and birch trees create a rich array of colors on this calm October morning. Ponds inundate the rough terrain. I snap a picture of a large object that stands in a creek bed. Is it a moose? <laughs> the road winds through a burned area, a reminder to the community of the forest fire that swept close to Stanley Mission in May of 2014. 900 residents were evacuated at the height of the fire. I arrive on the shore of the Churchill River. As I scan the beautiful picture that lies before me, I see Holy Trinity Anglican Church on the other side of the river. The river looks like a lake by Nova Scotia standards. I stand by the river's edge and I take a picture of the community on the far south shore. I meet Eugene and he tells me that a boat is about to arrive and carry us across the river to the church. My heart is pounding. The boat operator arrives and he informs me, informs us that he was just looking his fishing net. We climb into the boat. Eugene offers me his hand as my arthritic knees do not allow me to negotiate the step into the boat. Once seated, I ready my camera. The church stands majestically on a hill. I'm filled with awe. Eugene says that Holy Trinity still has services for special occasions. What a sight that must be to see the boats or snowmobiles and all-terrain vehicles in the winter when the river is frozen, making their way to the church for those special services. Eugene tells me it is an interesting crossing when the river freezes and the ice is weak in certain areas where the current is strong. I notice the church is under construction. Eugene informs me this is an ongoing project funded by the government of Saskatchewan. Holy Trinity Anglican Church is designated an historic property. Currently, sections of the stained glass windows are being replaced. We climb from the boat and Eugene leads me to the church door. Will it open? As I await an answer, I look to the side and see the brightly decorated picket fences that enclose the graves. The door opens, and I stand in wonderment. A sign on the wall reads, this church is the oldest building in Saskatchewan. It was constructed between 1854 and 1860 by local residents under the direction of Reverend Robert Hunt. The frame structure, the siding, and the floorboards are made from hand-sawn timber with hardware, window frames, and stained glass shipped from England. The size of the completed structure, its towering steeple and Gothic design, 
were a sharp contrast to other small log churches being built in the West at the time, although the settlement gradually shifted to the south side of the river. This church served as the focal point for Anglican missionary work in that area for over a century. The first service occurred on June 10th, 1860, and was performed in Cree. As I gazed at the font, I wonder how many people were baptized that day. What sermon was preached from the pulpit at that service? I have to steady myself as I look upward and peer at the beautiful stained glass windows. I imagine myself at a service here, reading from the King James Bible that sits on the lectern. I see the words Amazing Grace printed in Cree. It's translated by James Seti himself. James Seti was a native catechist, trained at the Church Missionary Society School in Red River. He served in Stanley Mission between 1847 and 1856. I look to the back of the church, and there is the vestry. I imagine getting robed for a service, a dream, perhaps. I leave Holy Trinity Anglican Church, feeling I will return. Eugene leads me to the back of the church. He wishes to show me where his ancestors are buried. I take a picture of the steeple that rises to a lofty height. Eugene waits for me and smiles. I sit for a moment and try to take in the sights and the smells on that beautiful October morning. Eugene invites me back during the summer when families gather on the field below the cemetery. I wonder what it would be like to participate in the ceremonial pipe celebration. Will I one day observe prayers being carried to the Creator in the smoke of the ceremonial pipe? We stop at the grave of Chief Nehemiah Charles. Eugene proudly speaks of his great-grandfather, who, as a young chief, was instructed in the early 20s to bury on an adjacent island those Christians who had died from the influenza. It is time to leave. I can see the island where the cemetery is located. Will I ever set foot on this hallowed ground? Eugene informs me that there has been vandalism in the church. He also laments the archaeological digs that have taken place near the church and the disappearance of some of the findings. Eugene's ministry is to sit with people who are lost and without hope. I call him a night traveler who sits and listens to those in great need. At the landing, Eugene's wife, Alice, meets us and takes a picture of Eugene and me standing on the shore. One of her personal treasures, a bead of cross that she gifted to me, hangs about my neck. Parker Palmer, in his book, Let Your Life Speak, Listening for the Voice of Vocation says, our deepest call is to grow into our authentic selfhood, whether or not it conforms to some image of who, how we think it ought to be. And as we do so, we will not only find the joy that every human being seeks, we will also find our path of authentic service in this world. True vocation joins self and service as Frederick Buchner asserts when he defines vocation as the place where your deep sadness meets the world's deep needs. I could not find my authentic selfhood until I journeyed outside my comfort zone. I had to discover the person behind the mask I wore. Now in words that we cannot understand the suffering of others until we claim our own loneliness as a source of human understanding resounded for me as I lay awake after each day's lived experience. 
By being with the other, I discovered who I was, and I better saw my true self. In my visit to northern Saskatchewan, I heard firsthand stories of abuse in the residential schools. It was a deliberate, systemic effort to break a people. It was an elder sitting across from his kitchen table from me who spoke with such wisdom and helped me to see the truth. He shared with me leaving his family at the age of seven and being driven 240 kilometers to Prince Albert. The road was unpaved then and very rough. The children were herded into the back of a truck with a canopy for a top, barely enough room to stand. He recalled the smell of vomit as children suffered motion sickness. He also remembered being separated from his family for extended periods of time. The children were forbidden to speak the language or practice their culture, and they were punished for doing so. Why had I been seemingly oblivious to the abuse that beset First Nations children in my home province? Had my position of privilege made me a slave to the dominant culture in which I lived? Was I so embedded in my own culture that I could not see the forest for the trees? The Apostle Paul would appeal to the Romans to present their bodies as a living sacrifice to Christ through conversion and sanctification, to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of their minds so that they could discern the will of God. Conformity is the death knell of one's ability to challenge authority. I read how Bishop Sue Moxley stated at the Truth and Reconciliation Commission held in 2011 in Halifax that right relations with Aboriginal people had to start with truth. Bishop Sue acknowledged that the Anglican Church had been complicit in the damage brought about by the residential school. She described the role of Gladys Cook, an Anglican Aboriginal elder and activist, and her experience at an Anglican-run residential school. Bishop Sue was wearing a string of beads that was gifted to her by the elder. I thought of the bead of cross that was gifted to me by Alice. I read the words of our, our Anglican primate, Fred Hiltz, who said, my church must listen to your stories, your hurts, the humiliation, and the burden of our lives on your sins. I hear these words with new ears. On the matter of life and death, I remember the wake ceremonies accompanying each funeral, and the way in which the community stayed with the grieving family for up to two days. There was comfort for the family in the preparation of their loved one being delivered back to Mother Earth. Although it was a time of sorrow, it was also a time of joy and reverence. In the tradition of Cree spirituality, the spirit of the deceased was being freed to join the ancestors. I recall the circle around the grave site the community formed for the burial of a child. I wonder now if the manner in which the community walked in a circle about the grave while taking earth in their hands from a mound and putting the earth into the grave was a kind of round dance that traditionally would be held to celebrate how the spirits and the people are never fully separated from one another. Death is viewed only as a continuing process, helping the family remember they too will one day join their ancestors. I reflect on what seems to be an ever-increasing, mourning, avoiding culture in my world. I wonder if I have properly grieved the deaths of family members. I had to step from my culture and allow my indigenous sisters and brothers to teach me. On the matter of grace, grace is the will and the love of God. 
Grace is a power that works in each of us prior to every good intention of the human soul is grace. There is a natural goodness that exists in each of us. I witnessed divine grace in the people I met in my cross-border journey. I found divine grace in the intersection of Christ's compassion in those who tended to the brokenness of others. I witnessed divine grace as a, on a corner of a street where the lost gathered to pool their resources to get by one more day as an elder met with them, spoke to them, and heard their cries. I found grace in a long-term residential facility where two pastoral ministers cared for the sick and showed a, a beautiful and genuine servanthood to their brothers and sisters. I found grace at a gravesite where a community gathered to support a grieving mother and father at a time of desperate need in their lives. I saw grace in the act of a bishop who led me to a bulletin board outside his office and showed the faces of young people who had recently committed suicide in the diocese. It was a reminder to him that amidst the despair, these young faces once had hope. The pastoral ministry, both laity and clergy, I met along the way, lost their lives in service to Christ and found life. Whoever loses his life for me shall find it. I felt within me an anger I had never experienced before. While I do not feel I'm a stranger to sympathetic identification with the brokenness of people, I meet in my pastoral ministry, I have not been attuned to external forces that have diminished the quality of their lives. Why have I not seen this before? Has my familiarity in my own cultural setting blinded and silenced me to the injustices that exist within my world? Have I been lost in the busyness of church and the multitude of tasks that accompany the maintenance of the church, but at a cost to the mission I have been called to? In the bishop's message to the Diocese of Nova Scotia and Prince Edward Island, Bishop Ron Cutler, my bishop, stated that mission is not about a church. It is about the world. Bishop Ron says the mission we are highlighting here is God's mission, not our own mission statement of our ideas of how the church can impact our communities. The God we worship is the God who sends good news to people and communities in need. The good news is not theoretical. It is real and personal and takes on the worst the world can do. By stepping from my comfort zone and entering a world and a culture of which I was unfamiliar, I have rediscovered my mission, which is directed by God's mission. I will continue to search for that place in me where the compassion of Christ intersects the brokenness of people's lives. I cannot venture into spiritual maturity unless I realize the need and the purpose of who I am in Christ. I'm a living witness of Christ in the world, and I know who I am by knowing whose I am. My journey to authentic selfhood continues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michael. Thank you. The stories of your own vulnerability and how you have been changed and transformed by your experience. 
Um, other questions and comments for Michael? We're just all by your bottom. Your stores. Hi, Michael. Hi, I'm here to move your story. Thank you. Um, when you talked about um, encountering the other, I'm interested in sort of the theory of otherness. Hmm. I wonder if you could speak a little bit. The other is the, the odd man out in any mm -hmm. environment. Mm -hmm. So I wonder if you could speak about yourself as other mm -hmm. in the experience versus. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So you've yeah. been the odd man out in your view. You Most there. definitely. Thanks. Perhaps I can, I, I think of a, a story that comes to mind, Leslie. Um, I was meeting with uh, an elder who took me under his wing, by the way. Um, I arrived in uh, Saskatoon, heading to Prince Albert and on to Larange without a clue of who I was going to meet. The only contact I had was Bishop Michael Hawkins and the indigenous bishop, uh, at Bishop Adam Halkett uh, in the diocese. I only knew that I was going to get as far as Prince Albert, and I knew I was staying with a family in Larange. That was it. That was it. And that's not me. <laughs> if I'm half an hour uh, early for a class, I'm feeling like I'm a half hour late. So this was not... Um, and uh, lo and behold, that first night, I had this vision that I was going to lay here in bed in Larange for the month of October and be afraid, because I'm an introvert. It's not easy for me in meeting people. Uh, it's something I, it takes time. And so here I was laying at night and thinking, well, this is good. Here I am, and I'll try to get outside and meet some people, but I didn't know what was going to happen. And the next morning, um, uh, the person who was at the home said, I'd like to take you for a drive, if I could, about the community. And um, the first person he met, he introduced me to, was an elder within the community. The elder took me under his wing. And when I thought I was going to wonder what I was going to do when I was there, I didn't have enough hours in the time of the day. This, your question. When we were sitting at a kitchen table and the feeling of being the other, and uh, uh, the elder was sitting, we were having bannock for breakfast, and uh, there were two grandchildren who stayed with him, loving relationship. And as we were talking, he lives at the end of a dirt road, and there were young people walking by the dirt road, and, he, and they disappeared into the woods. And as we were about to leave, he said, come with me, Mike, I want to. He called me uh, Ho-Ho because I reminded of him Santa Claus. <laughs> so come with me, ho ho. And so we began to uh, walk, and because he's a walker. And we ended up at the corner of uh, what is referred to as Chipping Corner. And it's directly across from the church, and it's directly in front of the liquor store. Chipping Corner is where the helpless uh, and hopeless uh, meet to pull their resources. The, uh, the elder went among them. And I was kind of like, I knew the elder was talking about me because I'd hear ho-ho every once in a while and <laughs> there'd be laughter. Uh, but I really couldn't understand because it was in Cree. And um, you know when we say uh, uh, you meet the face of Christ in everyone you meet, the blessing. May everyone you meet meet the face of Christ in you. In the midst of it, I was seeing the face of Christ in the elder. He was standing there listening, hearing the prayers. And it was one of those surreal moments that I really had never experienced before. But in the midst of this, what I thought, calamity. It was so confusing. I didn't, I was overwhelmed. Um, I was standing alone. Here I was. And here, everyone was. In the midst of that, a person began to come through. An elderly lady came through. And she weaved her way through the crowd. At that moment, there was a peacefulness that came over me. She hugged the elder. And she came to me as I was standing alone, held my hand, 
looked at me and smiled and continued on. So I, I felt this peace. <laughs> I became part of it. But just to complete this story, and as I turned around to see the person walk away, she was gone. I had my eyes <laughs> in my travels become blinded to the face of Christ that we see and the familiarity. I have such beautiful people with whom I work, and I can say with confidence when I go through my parish, I see the face of Christ and people I meet every night because I know where the face of Christ is going to be. You know? When you're on the, in the unfamiliar and you're looking for the face of Christ. <sighs> what I'm hearing you say, which I really appreciate, is that as the other in that community, you felt welcomed. Yes. And a sense of hospitality. Yes. And I think we could learn from that as others enter our communities. Thank you. Hi, Jenny. Um, I'm wondering if you took away from your experience an idea of how truth and reconciliation can move into a more authentic dialogue mm. in Canadians, to a more human place. Yeah. I, I, there's a part of me, Jenny, that wishes in some way, and again, it's because of my cultural bias, I wish I had been the process, I wish I had been involved much earlier. I think for all of us, is there a way that we can become engaged in the discussion? Can our institutions, can, our, can, can those, our training, can that be all part of? The invitation is open. I'm just wondering if sometimes the invitation is enough. You know what I mean? Like, I'm wondering if it's not something that we could begin to capture in, in as part of our curricula, as part of our learning process, that this becomes part of our learning too. Um, I'm only speaking for myself, and th that's important to recognize. There is a part of me that wishes that someone had given me just a little bit of a push because I couldn't do it on my own. Wonderful question. The only pain I felt was my own pain, my own fears, my own apprehension. When I was put into a place where I was totally vulnerable, I didn't know where I was going to go. I didn't know who was going to take care of me. I had no sense of that. It was then that the fear dissipated. I worried about such things. Can I wear my collar when I'm in position? Should I kind of tuck it away so that no one will know that I'm an Anglican priest, because obviously there are those who have had the residential school experience who would look at me as the perpetrator, my complicity in sin. Once I got through that, and I kind of settled into that vulnerability stage and open, and whatever happens, I have never felt so welcomed in my entire life. I never felt afraid. I was into positions. Um, I attended four funerals in four weeks when I was there. I went into communities where I was invited into homes. Eugene, the elder, others who just showed me things I had never imagined, and not once. And you know what I think the reason was for that? And I think it's getting a little step to that authentic selfhood people saw that I was genuinely open and vulnerable, and they welcomed me in. I never felt unsafe. Thank you. This is just a comment. I'm deeply touched by the fact that 
touch by how, um, how warmly and with so much hospitality that people are welcomed <coughs> into Aboriginal communities mm -hmm. when you make any kind of an effort at all. Yes. And um, they, they even see you as an insider if yes. you make that. And I'm reminded of um, some of the sisters in my community ministered in, in Lennox Island on Prince Edward Island. And Sister Florence McTague was there for years. Mm. And she overheard some of the young students calling people white trash. And uh, she said, no, so-and-so, that's mm. not very nice to do that. You know, I'm, I'm white trash, too. Mm. Oh, no, Sister, he said, you're one of us. Mm. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Mm. Thank you, Daniel. Um, I'm really, really intrigued and, and moved by, by the concept of having the courage to be vulnerable enough to be authentic to yourself. And I'm wondering if you can kind of extrapolate from your own experiences that into the wider church a bit, <laughs> and how the church can, can develop that courage. <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I'm sensing, I, I mean, I speak from a major context, but I think I can um, broaden it to, to a wide variety of foundations. Mm -hmm. That there's so much uncertainty and so much change and busyness and, yeah. and cultural shift going on right now. Mm -hmm. That the church is, is kind of struggling to find itself yeah. in a lot of ways, it's struggling to redefine itself. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like your, your message of, of just having that courage to be vulnerable is a message that needs to be heard. And I'm wondering, yeah, if you could yeah. say more, extrapolate it from the first one. More well, for me, I think the, um, the step, Daniel, was uh, when I heard Bishop Braun speak at uh, the opening words that he spoke when he was, um, was bishop, uh, was that um, we're not here uh, to keep doors open of churches. Forgive me, I'm not, I hope I'm not quoting this incorrectly, yeah, Bishop. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, good, good. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is what I think you said. Um, yeah. But our business is not about, um, our business is not about, and, and please, I hope no one takes this wrong because the church is absolutely, <laughs> It's our ecclesial structure. I mean, the church is where people gather. But, and not in my current experience, because my pastoral ministry is beautiful, and I'm not hearing this, but I can't help but think within um, many churches that people are not particularly acting Christian-like in the effort to keep doors open. And in the process of doing that, when that becomes the primary focus, then we end up into all kinds of assumptions, like competition, so that it's how well one church is doing as compared to another. Uh, it becomes a matter of, of saying, well, if we can just get our budget straight, and, but it can become so much an obsession that we lose the sense of worship. And I think therein lies the, there, it, there's where it lies for me, because I'm a cradle Anglican. I preach, I just delivered a homily for a nephew in the church where I have been born and raised. You can imagine the connections. But it, and everything, the church has been everything for me. But suddenly now I'm thinking, things will take care of that and people work so hard and I'm so appreciative but I think if I get caught up in the busyness of that, that somehow, just leave you one more thing. It just comes to mind as I look at you. I've spent close to 40 years accumulating degrees. I don't want to tell you how many degrees I have. <laughs> My only comment to that is, I don't think I'm gonna live long enough to shed them. Does that help? <laughs> Thank you. Carrie, my heart.
car down, partly because that is what I want to be able to teach people, that there are things that even though we have not personally done them, that we need to work to mm. repent of. Mm. But how do you do that when you have people who are on the other side, hurting, mm. hurting, hurting, mm. because they worked with a goodwill and good intentions and feel as mm. if they are being betrayed, mm. denigrated, and destroyed yeah. by hearing these stories mm. that people are accusing them of being this other mm. Mm. thing. Mm -hmm. If you're looking at your particular situation, Lorraine, um, I can, and not, and then, I, I, I hope the one thing I did share was my judgmentalness, and I'm not judging in any way, shape, or form. But if I could say within any context where there are, it's a multiple charge, and in your case, seven churches, um, I know, and I know those communities, because those communities are absolutely, uh, I'm one of those communities. Um, we, heaven forbid, I grew up in head of Jador, heaven forbid someone says I was from West Jador or East Jador. <laughs> um, that's, how, that's how connected we are. And um, for me, um, I think my salvation, can I, 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 I don't know. I'm going, just going to tell you what I know, is that I have never been more alive in my life. I'm, I've been on this earth for six decades, and I, and, I, I, and I can honestly say, at this stage in my life, that I have never been more alive than I've ever been in my entire life, and it's because I stepped outside of my comfort zone, and I think that's all I can Mm. Oh. who mm -hmm. are our parishioners as well, mm -hmm. who need care as well. Mm -hmm. How do we reach out to them to try mm. and, without denigrating and mm. without destroying them, bring them to some kind of peaceful reconciliation yeah. within themselves? I think how I would do is, it now is not something I can do for them or that I have to identify, and because in large, many cases they will not, those people who have been abused won't self-identify anyway. I think if I can be present, I think if I can just move, if people see in some way uh, uh, the face of Christ in me, that we can open a discussion, I think, and we can listen, not that you don't even have to say anything, but just making those connections, and it can be so simple, um, not, not confound at all. Not confounding now for me. I just need to be open. What was holding me back was the fact that I had built so many layers through my own insecurities, through my feelings, if you like, in those theological worlds of emptiness and loneliness, never quite understanding why I identified so closely with the poet T.S. Eliot. Um, cutting through that, just being open to the spirit and just wherever your feet will take you. Um, Michael, you, you, you talked about a lot of things in class, all the stories that you told us that you didn't have time to go into here. And one of those or you did mention um, that uh, one of the uh, learnings that you took away from your project was um, around the customs of mourning yes. uh, that changed the way you look, um, mm -hmm. or that, um, mm. you know, uh, yeah. by North Americans, um, mm. you know, we got to get over it quickly, get back to work, or what have you. Yeah. Were there other things like that that mm. you learned? And my second part of my question is, um, should everybody do this? Should every, should, should every seminary student mm -hmm. do what you did? Mm -hmm. uh, I know seminaries that require an uh, intercultural mm -hmm. immersion experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know that you can manufacture experiences mm -hmm. like that, but 
Mm. Um, those were, what, what, yeah. what are the things? Yeah. That, well, that um, I have more than anything uh, learned so much while I was there. I discerned a calling I had many, many years ago. It finally happened when I connected here because I had time to think and process. That was huge. I can only speak for me, but if there was any way on earth that people can be identified to get out and about and to be, and to be you know, watched and debriefed and how did you feel? Almost like a, what I understand is going to be a clinical pastoral education unit for me, <laughs> um, which I can't wait. Um, but but if, if there was that with regards to mentors, you know, from out, perhaps outside who are wonderful at doing that, for me it would have meant a great deal. I have so many stories. I, I just, I'm just, other, other stories are, uh, Oh my gosh, the elders had. I went into a long-term residential facility. I was taking communion. Uh, I was assisting with the Eucharist. And um, I was going into a facility and that I have had no familiarity with and with two pastoral ministers. And we were making our rounds and, you know, the, and, and because there's such a close connection between the pastoral ministers and, and the people there, relatives, um, that uh, every once in a while you'd get a, a snicker as I would go by and serve the communion. And, and I asked, I asked, it's so interesting, talk about make your, you know, talk about also, it's really good for your self-esteem because <laughs> as I would walk by and there'd be a giggle and uh, I said to one of the pastoral ministers, well, did I do something wrong? Of course, on my own, did I, you know? She said, no, but she said, this particular lady would like to take you home with her. <laughs> so I thought, that's good, that's good. Um, and it, 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 it but, but I went into a back room and uh, there, was, there was a gentleman that was there and he was, he, his work, his crafts were all there. And he was so labor intensive. His head was down, he was working on things and uh, I was introduced to him. And um, I should never forget this. And he looked at me and he had just, uh, he had made a hat and he was wearing the hat and this was a hat that he had actually crafted. And uh, then he began speaking to the pastoral caregiver, Incre, and uh, she said, uh, uh, this elder uh, connects with you deeply. He would like for you to wear his hat to see what it looks like. I placed the hat on my head, and there was a there was a a face of Christ. Thank you so much. Mark. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.